Good morning. Always morning in CS. I'm going to start by making myself thoroughly, not thoroughly, but even more hateful than usual. I'd like to remind you that this is uh, one third of your course and that you should not have any mobiles or IT machines in front of you that would distract you or the others around you so that you can give your full attention for around 45 serious minutes. It's a good, it's good practice and you know, it, it sort of gives you a chance to get away from the everyday bondage and slavery to the mobile phone and the, and the laptop. You, know, you can be free for four, 45 minutes, but really it's a requirement. Uh, you should not be playing around with your mobile or the IT uh, right now, but really just trying to pay attention to the lecture and benefit from the exercise that you're supposed to be having of actually listening to a lecture, no matter how boring, no matter how hateful the lecture is, but you know, it's something, you it's a skill you have to pick up, and I'm sure you know that by now. So, now that I have gotten your attention, I hope, <coughs> and you will hate me forever. Uh, it's two minutes past one, so I really think I should be able to begin. Basically, what I'm trying to do today is to help introduce you to one of the major ways of understanding human life, which has persisted throughout the centuries right into our own day. And it may be called tragic, once we understand what we mean by the term tragic, because I hope by now you realize every term you use has to be defined because people, different people understand the word differently. So tragic is what I'm going to try to help you understand in the lecture today. What makes something tragic? Not your failing in an exam, not, your, not something unhappy or miserable, uh, sad happening to you, unless you happen to be a great hero and somebody doing wonderful, trying to do wonderful things for humanity, and you don't get rewarded. The two have to be together, they have to come together for something to be called tragic. Tragic is about gra human dignity, human grandeur, a human victory in the face of all the great challenges that we meet in human life. So, I am not preaching this vision because I hate it when a teacher preaches at you. Um, this does this not happen to be my personal view of life, and I'm sure you're very interested in my personal view of life. When I die, you'll want to buy books uh, taught by me. But as a teacher, and I hope all of your teachers are doing that, we expose you to different views, and especially views that we may disagree with ourselves, but to help you to develop empathy. There are great human beings throughout the centuries and living today who actually believe the world we're living in is tragic. And therefore, it's very important for you to spend a little bit of time at least to try to understand what that means and to figure out why people uh, with great minds uh, would reach such a conclusion about life. Uh, the tragic is not opposed to the rational, it's opposed to the rationalistic. All humans are rational and, no, if, and you wouldn't be discussing anything with somebody who isn't rational. Uh, so it's a vision of life, a doctrine, an ideology, and a worldview, a way of understanding human life is, there are many different ways, but two major ways you're being exposed to in CVSP 201 are a tragic understanding of human life reached as a conclusion by very rational human beings. And then, as well, beginning really with Thucydides last week, but now when we go into Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then uh, Lucretius and Virgil, all of these people, basically their visions are rationalistic. But it's not that they are rational and the people who, uh, whose views are tragic are irrational. No, everyone is rational. Everyone seeks rationality in what they're doing, following logic, following good argumentation, following good evidence. They just differ on the conclusion about human life. And that's what I have to try to help you understand about the tragic. And no better example of a text than Oedipus the King could be given to us to take a look at uh, uh, that, to help us understand this view. Oedipus the King, I'm going to argue today, is being presented by Sophocles as the epitome of the rational thinker, the greatest mind around. In, indeed, he's also going to be he's being presented by Sophocles as the model of a democratic ruler. Someone who's extremely interested in the people and in doing what's best for society. But he is going to be revealed 
not to be in a world that is going to clap for him and cheer and give him all kinds of uh, kudos and tell him what a wonderful person you are and reward him with heaven or something like that. No, the only reward he's going to get is the dignity of being a somebody rather than a nobody as you've been introduced to these terms in the lecture by Professor Smith on, on Odysseus. All right? He's going to have, this is the only reward in a tragic world that a human can live for, but extremely important reward. Reward that makes life meaningful and worthwhile and wonderful and not pessimistic and negative. And uh, so tragic does not mean pessimistic, negative, cynical, uh, whatever. Tragic is tragic, and that's what this lecture hopefully will uh, try to help you at least appreciate how some people look at what it means to be tragic from the days of Sophocles to our own days today, passing through the 20th century, and the great tragic writers of the 20th century, many of them who have, under the rubric of atheistic existentialism, the Camus, the Sartres, the people like that in the 20th century. But the tragic vision is not primarily something that can only interest an atheist, but rather the tragic vision is something that ought to engage every human thinker, every serious human being who's asking about life and seeking wisdom. You know, you are all philosophers in this basic sense. You're all seeking to be a lover of wisdom in one way or another. You may be unconscious of it, you may not be, I don't know, but I mean, I'm giving you the option of the, uh, of the doubt that uh, basically you're all seeking wisdom. And this is the, the, the original meaning of philosophy, a lover of wisdom, someone who's seeking uh, wisdom, not just one plus one equals two in mathematical knowledge and scientific knowledge, very, very important, but seeking wisdom about human life, wisdom, you know, existential wisdom is the term that's used in, uh, in literature. So basically then, how are we to wrap our minds around what it would mean for someone to believe life is tragic? And how indeed can someone like Suffolk, so how can someone like Oedipus, the, the, the hero of this particular play, Oedipus the king, who kills his father and marries his mother and is so nasty to the prophet when Tiresias comes in, when you read this play, I hope you ought to read it before you listen to a lecture so nobody will influence you. <laughs> now I can influence you because I'm sure most of you haven't read it. Has anybody read the play? Uh -huh. You've spoiled it for me, two, three, four people. Otherwise, I have an audience, uh, unfortunately, who hasn't read it. So please don't be influenced by my, listen to what I say, but then go back and read the text and see if you see it there. How can someone like Oedipus the king, somebody who killed his daddy and married his mommy, and, and then the prophet comes and, you know, he's so nasty to him, you know, this is a hero, this is somebody who we look up to as a role model, this is a rational human being. Well, that's what my lecture is going to try to at least uh, present to you for thinking. So basically, let's go back to the beginning, a very good place to start. Nobody's seen, I hope, sound of music. Okay, um, here we are with, the, this is the work that we're doing. That's my email, by the way, if anybody wishes to kind of uh, hurl invective at me after you've heard the lecture and you'd wish to tell me how stupid it was, or if you'd like to ask questions, PS01, Peter Shbeaz, my name, is a very easy way to get through to me. This is a picture, first, the pictures there you have are of modern productions of Oedipus We've done it twice, once up at the Gulbenkian Theater in uh, BUC, a true theater, and then the second time in this auditorium pretending to be a theater. Um, as Oedipus is something that has inspired people all through the centuries, has even inspired people at AUB and LAU uh, to, and other places like that to continue to, do th to, to get inspiration from these works and present them even in the 20th and 21st century. You will see there a lot of people around them. This is the notion. This is what you need to. Uh, one of the things you need to remember as you read the text. The text is really a score for a play. Those of you who know music, you know with music you have a sheet and a score with notes on it and stuff like that. If that's all you have, you don't really are appreciating Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or anything that you're you're really interested in in, in, in appreciating. Similarly, a play has to be acted out and experienced. And this is a challenge to you all that all you have is the text. But the text is quite uh, rich in itself. But you have to try to imagine the thing being presented as a play. The two images there are of the king uh, Oedipus himself, surrounded by the people, done in one of many possible ways of doing it in the modern period. The other one is sort of something taken from, from 
a Greek uh, jar or something, I can't remember, but this is another uh, an artistic portrayal of a major event in the story itself, and this is when Oedipus meets the Sphinx. So notice how the Sphinx is uh, multi uh, there it's, it's a bur basically the Sphinx that's being spoken about here is primarily thought of as a part human, part bird rather than a lion as in Abul Hol, the Sphinx of Egypt. But anyway, let's proceed. We are, there are three major items I want to cover and that they're all on the very first page of your fly sheet. The rest of it is something hopefully that you can read for yourself later on and see the flow of my lecture. But you know, really spelt out for you so that you don't have to be worrying about you know, uh, taking down every single thing that's said. Uh, I've done this on purpose because I am presenting this as a kind of an exercise in an argument, an interpretation, but uh, with an argument from the text itself. And that's, that will be presented for you on the rest of those sheets. The very last uh, page we, uh, has a summary, if you like, at the top of the page. The, uh, the, it should have conclusion at the top of that page, but it didn't fit in somehow. So you have conclusion on the page before, at the bottom of it. What is human life all about in this tragic perspective? That's the conclusion of everything I'm going to be trying to say today. See what you have gotten from it, and see if you can see the conclusion. Uh, you know, it's a, a way to understand the heart of what's trying to be said in those bullet points on the very last page. Uh, the, uh, the further reflections on the tragic, which I normally never have time to reach, but I'd like to uh, point out to you a few interesting items about tragedy in general and the tragedians of the period we're studying. Uh, the, the phrase in there, you know, further reflections on the tragic, no promises made, none broken, is a very important slogan for you to remember because that's at the heart of this understanding of life. Life has made no promises to you and me as individual human beings. Therefore, why should we complain? Nobody's promised that we will have a just life, that we'll be happy, that if we do our best, we're going to be rewarded. Why do you think that that's the way the world is? You see, this is just, this is just the way you think as a human being, but that's not the way the world thinks, not the way the cosmos that Homer has described for us. That's not the way it is. So no promises made, no promises broken. Basically sort of a, a, a way of saying, you know, be tough, be realistic, don't live life, you know, as Rabi' al-Adwiya will say in her Islamic culture much later, la khawfan min al-jahim wa la tam'an bin na'im bal hubban bika ya Allah. All of you who know Russian have understood that. What it means is she's saying life is not to be lived fearing death, uh, fearing hell, or, you know, desiring heaven, but rather for my love for you, O God. This is in a monotheistic uh, context, okay? So in the tragic context, you don't live life to be rewarded and fearing punishment. You live life for excellence. You live life for doing something that will give yourself a, a name, your self-dignity, something that will help the polis, as we will see, society, human society, that will help humanity. That's what, that's what life is all about. That's the immortality that life offers you. The immortality of your name, the immortality of your simply knowing you, are you yourself, having the self-satisfaction that you've done your best in a given situation, and the, sa the satisfaction of knowing that, that as you're doing this, you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for humanity, and therefore, uh, if you're doing it in this way, humanity will, in one way or another, uh, be helped. So, no promises made, none broken is a very important kind of thing to remember as you look at what it means to be a, a tragic hero or a person who is living a life that is, that is going to be tragic but not, not sort of pessimistic or negative but rather great. With respect to the comic, this is not the, it's not that tragic is about crying, you know, boo-hoo and misery, and the comic means, you know, comedy means, therefore, ha-ha, or something like that. In, th in theater, and in drama, and in all of literature, tragedy and comedy, which were first formulated, really, in this Greek world, uh, really had much deeper meanings. Comedy basically meant any, uh, any story, or any play, or any some, a novel now, or whatever, that has uh, a hopeful look at human life, that when you do the right sort of things, the world is made to give you good results. That's comedy, if you like, in, in, its, in its deepest philosophical sense. Tragedy is what I've been talking about for the beginning of this uh, term, that no, that when you do your best, do your best, but don't expect reward. So that's the major difference, because in comedy you have high comedy, you have all kinds of comedy, not just farce and, you know, ha-ha. 
So, uh, so the, qu the point there is that in tragedy, finally, there's no hope, but there's no despair. Hope means the assuredness that you're going to be rewarded in some way. Uh, or life is going to turn out right if you just face it properly and use your reason correctly and you do, you know, you're as moral as you can be according to your own standards. But there's no hope in the world of tragedy, but there's no despair. Because it's not like it's meaningless, absurd, sin, you know, life is just a, uh, no, 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 life is full of meaning, full of challenge, full of dignity, full of richness, full of grandeur. Uh, through suffering insight. So suffering is not your enemy for the tragic world. Not pain and pe pleasure are the masters of life, as the utilitarians will tell us later on, uh, and coming from hedonism and epicureanism. And you'll come to epicureanism at the end of the semester, so you'll have a chance to, to argue with this kind of a view. But for these people, suffering, pain is not your enemy. You're, you don't want it, but you know, it's there in life, and therefore make use of it in the best possible way. And it will make use of itself if you have the right attitude. Suffering is what gives you insight. Suffering is what gives you maturity. Suffering is what helped Ammo Gilgamesh to mature, not the fact that he finally accepts death. He's accepted death right from the beginning, if you read the whole story. That's not the point of his maturity. His maturity from a tragic point of view is that he seeks insight. He isn't afraid of, of the pain and the suffering and the, and the challenges of that horrible journey there. And everybody's telling him, you know, stop and stop and don't do it and you'll never get it and you won't be rewarded and, you know, eat, drink and be merry and you know, blah, 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 all that. You know, and he refuses. That's his maturity. Uh, the, in the first part, he has accepted death. And he tries to help Enkidu to accept death. So he doesn't need to accept death to be a mature human being. He needs to go through the, 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 the journey, the second journey, which reaches insight. Now the insight is tragic. The insight is no matter what you do, no matter how hard you get, it's only the Utnapish teams of the world, the slob, if you remember the story. When he meets him, he tells him, you? You're the guy who got immortality? I was expecting something great. You, know? you are nothing. All right? You see, this is the stuff you need to look at in these, in these texts. They're so rich when you sort of see these items in them rather than sort of the first look. So basically, only through the suffering of, of, of Gilgamesh did he become more human. The suffering leads to insight. So suffering is not your enemy. Your enemy is, is to be a nobody, to, uh, to, to sort of just give in, to just seek a life of, of pleasure and reward in the simple sense of the word. So uh, again, in, in tragedy you have this, you know, are we free or are we determined? Was Homer confused? Ya haram, he couldn't really know, well, are we free or determined? The free and determined thing is a, is a later contraption of the, philosoph the abstract philosophers who want everything to fit into a nice formula. We must be either free or determined, okay? Great literature choice presents humans as they are. We are, of course, determined by many, many things, but we are also free. And it's, the, the challenge is to try to understand how different cultures, how different texts have tried to represent for us what is the, the stuff of our freedom. It's not an abstract formula. It's something lived. It's something existential. It's something you're, you experience all the time and you grow in understanding it as you practice it. So free or determined? No, it's free and determined. And hopefully, uh, uh, I would want to, if I had enough time, to, to convince you that this is what Sophocles is presenting now with our friend. Uh, just as Homer had presented it in Zeus's statement, oh, these mortals, they're always blaming us, but it is they, their recklessness, that gives them more sorrow than that which is given. So there is a determinism, what is given, but they have the, the, the ability to be reckless or not reckless. So the, 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 the two are in Homer. The two are in Sophocles' as Oedipus. Oedipus is determined. He, whatever he does, he's going to kill his daddy and marry his mommy. All right? But he's free to either sit back and wait and let it happen to him passively, you know, hold a dagger in his hand and you know, undo his zipper. Or I don't know. But he can do it passively. Or he can take, you know, take life into his own hand and, ch and challenge the way Gilgamesh does. He doesn't just accept you're going to have to die and not just die the way he had understood it at the beginning. As a, you know, oh, that's life. No, but death, you know, look, look at the way Enkidu dies. Look at that horrible place everybody's going to go to after death. I'm not going to just accept it. I'm going to do my best to see if I can get past it. This is the stuff of all progress, scientific, literary, religious, thoughtful, etc. Not stopping at some stupid barrier, you know. Oh, you must die. You know, you've got to have, it has to happen to you. What happened to Enkidu? What happened to, uh, now just eat, drink, and be merry, you know, live life. This is the, this is the tragic aspect of Gilgamesh. The play, it's, the work itself is an epic. 
but there are tragic elements. And that's one of the things I want you to see. The play now is a tragedy. That's the genre. That's the form. Drama, play, tragedy. The tragic element can be found in any work you read. In, when you come to Plato and in the cave, ask yourself, in Plato's cave there's a tragic element. Because, you know, just to, to, to try to go ahead of things for you, but Plato was a tragic poet. We might be reading his Oedipus the King had he not decided to be a rationalist when, when he met Socrates. But when he writes the great uh, part of the Republic called the cave, see if you can see the tragic elements in the cave. So tragic is what I'm talking about in this particular lecture, not just the tragedy of Sophocles, but the tragic element that you've seen in Gilgamesh, the tragic element that you see in Odysseus when he goes down and meets Achilles, the, 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 the epitome of a tragic hero who has chosen, used his freedom to decide to die young, but be a great hero rather than to live a long life, but be mediocre, to be a somebody rather than a nobody. When he meets him, what happens? You know, he tells him, I wish I was still alive, and I wish I was the slave of a slave of the nobody of a nobody of a nobody rather than death. This is tragic, you say. This is the tragic element. The interesting thing that Homer's showing us there, by the way, is that Odysseus simply takes this as a challenge. It does not defeat the tragic hero. It now makes him a, a mature tragic hero. Now he's facing death as he has always, seeking heroism as he has always, but now with an existential taste of death is a horrible thing. If Achilles is unhappy, am I going to be unhappy? See, this is the tragic element that I'm trying to help you become sensitive to a little bit in all of literature that you might read and understand what it involves. So free and determined in a tragic choice, a no-win situations. Inevitability is at play. There is a determined element. I call it a cosmic booby trap. Okay, the world is made in such a way that Oedipus is going to kill his daddy and marry his mommy. Whatever he does, because if you, once you read the story, you'll see he tries to run away from home. He does all the things a rational person, moral person can do. He goes to Apollo, where the prophecy has come. He's going to kill his father and marry his mother. And he's so horrified by it, he goes to Apollo. He says, you know, Apollo, you know, help me. What does Apollo do? Apollo says, he just tells him, I see your future. You're going to kill your daddy and marry your mummy. And, ah, and they made a horror movie out of it. Okay. You know, read the text. When you read the text, I hope you'll see some of this stuff there. I'm not just inventing it for myself. You know, there's no help for you in this. You're on your own, baby. You know, so what does he do? He does what he can do best. He still thinks these are his true parents, where he is. He does not know that fate has put him in as an adopted child of parents who have not bothered to tell him he's the adopted child. He thinks there's their real child. So what does he do? He tries to run away from home so he'll never kill his father and marry his mother. What happens? He winds up going to where his real fa father and mother are. Uh, and so, you know, in using his freedom, he is also determined. But he's using his freedom. And what makes him great is in doing that, what happens? He saves the new city is going to, the new Polish Thebes. He saves them from the curse of a sphinx. <clears throat> and then he becomes a great ruler, a wonderful democratic ruler, because at one point the chorus asks him, please don't do that. And he says, I have decided with using my mind, my rational mind, that there is a plot against me. And I am going to take care of the two main people who are plotting against me. And, and they say, no, no, please don't do that. Please don't do that. And so he says, okay. If that's what you want, the people, you can't be more democratic or more humble as a democratic ruler than that. You know, so if you talk about, talk about his pride and his arrogance and some sort of silly uh, un misunderstanding of what those terms mean in the play, basically, what does he do? He says, okay, if that's what you want me to do, then I won't do it, even if it's going to cost me my life. And then when he's seeking to find out what is the source of the problem that Thebes is having, the problem is that a king has been killed and hasn't been revenged. Who has killed the king? The audience, of course, knows. You, because you've read the play. He killed the king, but he didn't know it was the king. You know, Range Rovers, motorcycles, blah, blah, blah. They come and they slap at him. He's a tough guy, so he, he kills them all, except for one, because somebody has to tell the story. Remember, it's a story. All right? But he doesn't know who this guy is. Who is this guy? The king of, that was assassinated. They don't know he's the one who killed him. But who also was that king? He's poppy, he's bad, he's daddy. He has no idea this is his daddy. He's defending himself. So the guy is running away from doing the horrible thing he's supposed to do. And then, you know, he defends himself and he saves the whole city from something using his mind. He's a hero of the mind just as much as Oedipus, but in a different way. 
and, and Gilgamesh is a hero of the mind also but in a different way. Don't get into these sort of superficial ways of understanding the use of the mind. Utnapishtim exists. I'm a scientist. I'm going to go and make the experiment. I'm going to go and see what happened with this Utnapishtim. How come he's alive? I'm not going to just accept some kind of blah blah slogan about how I should believe that no immortality. Well, this guy's immortal. A fact. I'm going to go find him. They all use their minds, so we wouldn't be interested in them. But this is, I think, a lesson I'm hoping you're all getting from these courses you're going to be taking, is that the mind is used in so many different ways, not just sort of the computer way. Right? But the mind is used in, in, much, in many, many more ways, not just the IQ test you take. Okay? So uh, Gilgamesh was using his mind in seeking to see Utnapishtim. All right? Oedipus is using his mind to get away from his parents so he won't kill them. Okay? He's using his mind in defending himself when he's attacked. All right? He's using his mind as a wonderful ruler because that's how Sophocles presents him. He's been a wonderful ruler. Everybody calls him just such a great ruler. You know? And this is, the, you know, this is the stuff of the tragic choice. He's in a no-win situation. If he stays, you know, he cannot avoid. He can never win. By, do, by trying to avoid his fate, he winds up going to his fate and having a disastrous end personally. Blinds himself, he's a great hero, he takes responsibility. They say, who made you do it? What God made you do it? You know, he doesn't say, oh, well, it was Eve, it was the serpent, it was somebody else. You know, the past the buck phenomenon. It was, you know, this God or that God or somebody else. He says, okay, it was Apollo, you see, this is Sophocles telling you, there is a deterministic element, but it was my hand, says Oedipus. You see, he takes responsibility for what he does. The two are there all through the texts of both Homer and Sophocles. If you look for them, man is free and determined. There's a tragic choice in front of people, however. Achilles can either choose to be a nobody and live for a long life or to, to uh, live a short life and be a hero. No win situations. That's the stuff of tragedy. Therefore, don't live life for reward in the normal sense. The reward comes at a much di different level. Uh, a nobody, basically, in other words, there's a basic incongruity, lack of sync between you and me as human beings and as rational human beings and as des desiring to be moral human beings and the world we live in, the cosmos. There's a friction between the universe we live in, the way it is set up, the way its laws work, and the way you and I as humans work. This is the tragic gap. All right? In rationalism, you see, there's no tragic gap. In rationalism, if only we reform the education system, if we improve our institutions, if we use the mind properly, etc., etc., there's nothing tragic about the world we're living in. It's just a question of ignorance and, you know, becoming more and more enlightened. Enlightenment, eh? Okay, but, you know, that's one very popular way of looking at life nowadays, but for some people, but, all right, but others still look in one form or another to the world they're living in, even today, as primarily, basically, closer to the vision of these, uh, this tragic vision of life, that don't live for reward, no promises made, no promises broken, but life is full of meaning if you take it in terms of what you can do, but recognize there's no uh, basic harmony between you and the cosmos. The Peloponnesian War that you've read in the past, uh, th th that was assigned to you in the past week, I don't know whether you've all reached it or not, but the Peloponnesian War was the actual context, by the way, for, the re for much of the rest of the Greek semester. Uh, basically, the Peloponnesian War evoked two radical responses which we're looking at, a tragic response and a rationalistic response. What was the Peloponnesian War? It was a great civil war, and everybody was, you know, we don't know what that's like now because we live in harmony today, and there, you know, nobody's fighting anybody in Lebanon, we're all loving one another, but, you know, basically they were, they were everybody was fighting everybody and uh, uh, the Greek world was, uh, was you know, uh, it, what did, how did it inspire people's thinking and their imaginations and their philosophy and everything they're doing? Well, in two major ways, many ways, but two major ways. One was the tragic, the other was the rationalistic and they were at the same time. So don't think of them that the rationalistic is somehow later on, you know, this is enlightenment, this is modernity, this is the true modern man. There's no such thing as a modern man. Uh, that's a, an abstraction anyway. But there are modern elements in, uh, in each of the great heroes we deal Otherwise, we wouldn't be dealing with them. Modern meaning they still speak to you and me as, uh, and, uh, as human beings. So basically, the Peloponnesian War was such a horrible thing that some people responded to it 
by saying, you know, the philosophers that you're coming to, this is a question of, so of society reform, social reform. We must change the education system, was, was the heart of Plato's hope when you read the Republic. If we change the education system and make it such that every human can discover what they're best at, then humans will want to do what they're best at. And if everybody's doing only what they're best at, the garbage collector won't want to be president, and the president will want to be a garbage collector, if that's what the education system reveals. There's no caste system here. You simply, the system will give each one the, 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 the potential, supposedly, that's what he was hoping for. At the end of his life, Plato, of course, uh, decides this is, doesn't work very well, and so he, he, he writes the laws, which is, you know, you need power to impose this. But anyway, the philosophers were basically hoping this was the rationalist view, not rational, but rationalist view, that justice might be rational, cosmic justice might be rational. You and I are rational, but is cosmic just is the world uh, rational? The rationalists think, yes, it is. Uh, what the tragedy, the tragic, and this is, you see, you've got to understand this as a dialogue going on. Sophocles is dialoguing with the philosophers, and he's saying, look, I, here's a philosopher, if you like. Here is, here is uh, Oedipus, the greatest mind of his day, the only one who could solve the riddle of the Sphinx, the only one who uses his mind, and he has him use his mind all the time, investigating, doing the right thing as a good political leader, doing all the correct things to be done by the human mind. But the world he lives in isn't rational. The world he lives in is just the world. It's just, it is. It's just the way it is. Right? It's beyond human sort of uh, categorization, and, and it's not made for us in the first place. So this was the, you know, the tragic, the rationalist is much more common for you all, the tragic is more difficult, and so basically if you have, I have some conclusions there, the tragic interpretation of basically war, human misery, corruption, injustice, are inevitable because of the very nature of things, because things are out of sync. We, the world wasn't made for us, so that we are going to be experiencing war and human misery and corruption and injustices, inevitable parts of just simply the very nature of things, the way we are as human beings, our human nature, which Thucydides focuses on, by the way, so we, you know, when you do get to, uh, to Thucydides, notice he just, you know, the human nature always, you know, uh, the, the enemy of itself in this sense. Just basically there's this powerful lust and greed for power, which reason, the only hope is reason for Thucydides, but reason doesn't seem to be more powerful than the other. The other one seems to always be taking, therefore there's this tragic element in Thucydides, that we have reason, and when we use it, we could do great things, but there's this something in our very nature. He doesn't say we're wicked. He doesn't say it's our fault. That's the determined aspect in Thucydides. Our nature is like that. Our nature also gives us reason, but unfortunately, in fact, Lust for power seems to always be more powerful than human reason, and this is tragic because the, 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 the history of the Peloponnesian War has been called the tragedy of Athens. If you look at it in, from a tragic perspective, Athens, which could have been so great, which could have been the teacher of all the Greek world and more, which, which had presented so many wonderful things, etc., etc., when it lost its proper uh, leadership, it sort of becomes might is right, might is right, might is right. And then you have the, the Milos debate where, where the Athenians are arguing might is right and the millions are arguing what supposedly the Athenians have taught the Greeks to do to think in terms of standards, principles, stuff like that. And the millions tell, they give them the, the tragic pronouncement to the Athenians, if you go on doing what you are doing, your end is going to be miserable. So Athens, the potentially great, is is totally uh, defeated at the end. So you see these tragic elements, once you, once you learn to sort of look for them, you'll find them in all great literature, even not just in tragedies, that this is a part of life. And that's why it's important for you to understand it. Uh, hopefully you'll go beyond it, then you'll find a different view, but that's, you know, that's your business uh, totally. But this is one view that humans have. So basically, the argument for the rest of this semester, really, and it's an ongoing argument, uh, is rationalism going to give us our salvation? Is rationalistic enlightenment the, the true enlightenment that we look for? Or is there not something that we need to get from the poet, from the poetic insight, from the, uh, you know, from, from the romantic side of, of human life, from the, uh, the existential aspect of human life that goes well beyond something you can put into any kind of rationalistic analysis? Uh, and what I say there is, you know, from my point of view, 
you, why do we need to choose after all these centuries? We can kind of take a look and see something great in each of these views. We don't have to continue to fight uh, Plato's battle where he wanted to kick all the tragic poets out of his uh, thing. We can learn from both and sort of uh, find a, a better uh, solution. So, in the very little time I have left, but I do have 15 minutes, in fact, so that's pretty good. Let me try to take you through that first page of the fly sheet. In my ramblings, I have gone over basically some important items, believe it or not, for those of you who are still awake, just to help put you into the atmosphere of things. You know, I'm not a high school teacher teaching you one, two, three, and you'll take your memory and give it back. I try to inspire you uh, with what I'm doing, but I do have a, an argument that's written out here for you to take a look at carefully later and you know, shoot holes in it or learn something from it. But basically, <clears throat> we are in Athens, a period when one of the first experiments we know of in democracy was working, so the whole audience for the play of Sophocles is an audience that believes they are part of the democracy of Athens, which of course, as the lecture has told you previously in, in the last week's lecture, democracy didn't mean what it has developed into in many different ways, uh, for better or for worse, but basically it meant a first experiment in, in giving a significant number of people the freedom to be citizens, the freedom to vote, the freedom to... So Sophocles himself was a very multi-talented uh, fellow. He was a tragic poet, one of the greatest tragic poets uh, ever. But he was also the priest of the god Apollo, and he was also a general in the army of the great leader Pericles. This was sort of the, this was the kind of later on the Renaissance man, and you know, this is the kind of ideal of a well-rounded person that you're all hopefully still at least think about being instead of coming into a UB and wanting to just have a technical education, get your BA and, you know, and be able to buy, uh, do whatever you want to do, but rather to be formed as a human being. That's what university is supposed to be all about. And so this is what Ath Athens was, that, that was the kind of great climate of Athens. And so in that, in that period in Athens, about 100 years around the, the year 400 before and up to uh, under one of the, great, the greatest leaders they ever had named Pericles, was a period when great... Uh, art, great uh, theater, great philosophy, great uh, sci scientific experiments, great all kinds of wonderful things uh, uh, were taking shape uh, uh, at that time. So the audience for the play, and this is what I mean by empathy, try as much as you can, we never can do it fully, but always before you start reading into plays, a later interpretation of what it's, what you think it's saying. That's wonderful. These great plays keep inspiring people, you know, but first try empathy. Try to put yourself as much as possible into the world of the text itself. Try to listen carefully to the poet, to the author of the play, what they are saying. Don't miss the nuances. Don't miss, don't just jump for the obvious things here and there. Pride, ar arrogance, uh, anger, uh, you know, the, these cliches, you know. Try to really see what, what's he saying, you know, how he's presenting this guy in this, uh, as the most wonderful possible fellow, etc. The prophet comes in. Remember, prophets can mean so many different things. He's just, a, he's just a psychic. He's just somebody who can, you know, tell you something more about the future, you know. He's a, I don't know what their names are anymore. Leila Abdul Latif, Maggie Farah, Mike Farali, or Mabarif Shu, you know. They, you know, they have some, you know, he has some, he's not, he's not at all interested in humanity. Notice that this is how Sophocles presents the prophet. He comes in and they want him to, to give the, because he has knowledge more than they have, help them to solve the problem of this whole society. The polis, symbol humanity, is under threat of a great plague. And life has come to a halt in all different ways. And so Oedipus is the great political leader responding to the people coming and saying, oh, you are a great leader. You have helped us so much. You saved us from the Sphinx in the first place. Please help us now. He says, I'm going to do it, whatever it takes, okay? Notice how Sophocles is presenting the guy so that by the time the prophet comes in, notice how the prophet is the villain in that thing. It's not his anger and his pride because he's speaking this way to a prophet. You know, this is your understanding of arrogance and pride. This is not Sophocles' understanding of arrogance and pride. All right, that, I would, I'm claiming, you can disagree. But basically he's, he's, he's saying, you know, this guy comes and says, I have the answer to your, to the plague that's hitting you, but I ain't gonna give it to you because it's gonna cause me pain. Wawa, busal wawa, hatal bawa, okay. Okay, uh, uh, put yourself in the place of Oedipus. You know, he's responsible for the life of this community, the polis, which represented true humanity. 
all right? And this guy has the answer, and, and the only thing he will say, I'm not going to tell you because it's going to cause us pain. You see how suffering is not your main enemy, all right? But he's, pain and suffering is, is the prophet's worst enemy. So this prophet is, 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 has nothing of human uh, political, you know, polis concerns, the social concern, interest whatsoever. He's only interested in protecting his own skin, all right? And then Crayon, who is supposed to take over the leadership of the community and find out who killed the king at the time, didn't bother to do it. You know, I was sick yesterday, I had a toothache, and sorry, sir, I couldn't give you the exam, etc. You know, he, 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 so when, when, when Oedipus is listening to all this stuff, he uses his mind, man. And his mind tells him there must be a conspiracy, because he was part Lebanese, of course. But still, it's still, you know, politi if you're using your mind politically, how can such horrible things happen by people who are responsible and they're, you know, not helping us to, to help humanity? So he gets angry. Oh, oh, anger. You naughty boy. La, he should be a statue, you know. He should, he should. If he didn't get angry, he would be a bad boy. <laughs> He'd be not doing his duty. So it's not his anger there. Notice what happens with Tiresias. When does Tiresias give the truth, supposedly? Only when he's insulted personally. Insult me personally? That's when he gives the answer. He gives the answer only when he's personally touched. So, I mean, think of these things when you come to these silly conclusions about this work. Oh, this is a play about Oedipus's pride, you know, and, and therefore that's what that's his downfall, you know. Pride comes before a fall. That's Shakespeare. That's in a monotheistic Christian perspective. Here it's not pride comes before a fall. And anyway, this is not pride. This pride is when you don't do your duty. Pride is when you arrogate to yourself something that doesn't belong to you. He never does that. Pride is not when you get angry because somebody is telling you I have the cure for, for, the, for society and I don't want to give it to you because uh, I'm that. So basically then, what we have in this democratic world, so first of all, think democracy as you're noticing what's happening. Don't think sort of platitudes and cliches about anger and pride. Think about a democratic situation. Think about Sophocles as presenting him as a great democratic leader in, uh, and, the, and what he does uh, particularly. But then notice the, the conclusions of it all, of course, are... The, horror, the, the tragic element. What does he have? His chorus, you know, where the mouthpiece, if you like, of, of some of the main things that he wants to present to us at the heart of the play. But sometimes the chorus themselves are just afraid of pain, so there's no hero in the play at all other than Oedipus. All the others represent us. We are Oedipus and the other characters. They represent part, you know, aspects of our humanity. But the aspect of our humanity that is the role model for us is what he's presenting through Oedipus. The chorus, uh, at one point, doesn't want to tell the truth. Because, you know, he's saying, you know, avoid pain. So he's not, he doesn't, they don't fit. But the chorus, at the climax of the play, when he has discovered he is the one who killed his father, killed the king, he's the, the source of all this plague, all right? So he then punishes himself as he said he would. But this is the horrible end that this uh, hero reaches after having done his best in, in the best possible way. What does the chorus say? They say, oh, you wicked man, you're getting your just desserts. You are angry and proud. Naughty, naughty, naughty. You know, now you're getting punished. Read, read the play. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. It's all lamentation. How could such a great man as yourself, how could this happen to you? This is the tragic. How can something so horrible happen to a great person? All right? Not how, you know, the other would tend it down to some silly morality play that he was wicked and angry and proud. And so he was getting punished for that. I mean, if you read it that, it wouldn't have survived up to today. Believe me, somebody would have put it in the trash can a long time ago, the play. You know, it's because it has these echoes in it that still speak to people throughout the centuries that it's important. So basically, the, the atmosphere of democracy. And then, but very important, though, what we've been talking about the world. What is the world? The world is the way Homer has defined it. The Homer is this cosmos. Order, but order which at the same time is beauty. When you break the order, you do something ugly. So what has, what, this is the, these are the terms. Not faithfulness and faithlessness, that's monotheism, all right, treachery and love, all right. Or not uh, uh, using your reason according to rational principles, right and wrong, uh, good and evil. No, that's not the, the, the mindset. The morality here is the morality of an aesthetic morality. Things are either ugly or beautiful. Beautiful is good, ugly is bad. Now, what is beautiful? Beautiful is keeping the order. What is ugly? Breaking the order. He kills his dad, he marries his mother. That's ugly. That's not a sin in a monotheistic sense. It's not a, a, a rationalistic, stupid mistake, all right? It's a tragic breaking of a given order of things that is 
it's ugly. So it's it, all the language that Sophocles uses about what happens to him is all within this aesthetic model of how, could, how horrible this is, how ugly how this, how could this happen, but how could it happen to you, such a great man? That's the gap that people often miss when they're interpreting uh, this play from some other point of view. So basically then, the, the, it's just simply the order, the beauty. This order is impersonal. You just go through those points there. It's impersonal. It isn't made for you and me. Uh, it th there are three dimensions of our life which are interacting all the time. And how can anybody, no matter how enlightened or how rationalistic they are, uh, how can they ever know what is the truth? The truth is hidden. The truth is concealed. It's aletheia. It only decides to reveal itself when it wants to. You cannot force it to reveal itself. You can't, no matter how great your mind is, you can never know what's going on in this university. It just reveals itself at certain moments. And in this tragic world, when the truth reveals itself, it could be horrible. It isn't necessarily, the truth is not necessarily something good, as in the rationalist world of Plato, goodness. The truth is not something that's good for you in the monotheistic world. You know, somehow always God is doing something for the human in some way or other. It's simply here, just, that's just the way the world is. The truth is ambiguous, hidden. Only a, only a Tiresias can can see it, but Tiresias is, a, is certainly not the hero of the of, uh, a human hero of the play. Uh, the three dimensions: there's the cosmic, there's the political, there's the private. How can you ever know how? So he's great at the political level. He's a you know he's a good political thinker, and, uh, and but at the private level, he doesn't even know who his true family is. And at the cosmic level, he doesn't really know. You can never go against your fate, <laughs> the determined part. So, you know, this, uh, this makes for tragedy. It's because you and I are in li living in this kind of world. That's the tragic myth. If I was preaching, and I don't want to preach it, <laughs> but if I was preaching, and that's what I would tell you. Look, Habibi, can any of you ever really figure out these three th things that are happening to you? No matter how developed you become, or what a wonderful computer you, can they ever, can you really ever understand everything that's going on in this universe, the truth there? And what what leads you to believe it's going to be good when it does expose itself? No promises made, no promises broken. That's the tragic world, in other words. It's just there, it's just given. No, there's no attempt to justify it in sort of a human rational terms. It's just lots. The lots were there. So when the lots were drawn, well, that's, what, you know, that's what Homer says in the Iliad. Okay, the sky was given to Zeus, lots. You know. uh, Hades was given the underworld you know, after death, and Poseidon was given the sea. Everyone has his lot, his share. This is why Athene can't help uh, Odysseus on the sea, because that's not her share. And when Zeus tries to get Poseidon to do something he doesn't want to do, he tell Poseidon sends back a message, as great you are, I'm your equal. You can't force me to do anything. I don't want to do. So this is the kind of, you know, the uh, complex world that's given with shares and fates. And not even Zeus is ever allowed by, by, humor, by Homer to go against the, 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 the given order of things. The system, the cosmos, the order is God in this system. That's why G-O-T, I found a useful thing to think of, the given order of things or the cosmic order of things. But that would be caught, whereas the cat's caught. No, but God, God. Okay, because monotheists tend to think of God as the absolute. Here, the, the absolute is no one of these gods. It's the system, the order. And that's why life can be tragic. And this is the tragedy of Sophocles. There's no God to forgive him. There's no God to look at the extenuating circumstances. There's no God to reward him for all that he's doing. There's nothing outside of himself. There's just a system. You break the system, baby, you do something ugly. When something ugly happens, the whole system works for itself to come back to beauty, to order. You've disordered. Okay, this is the notion of nemesis, the automatic retribution. It's going to come at you, baby. If you break the order, there's no forgiveness, there's no extenuating circumstances. It's simply a system. It's given. The ultimate principle are this, the moiri, the shares. The gods are immortal and powerful, but they're not perfect or benevolent or anything like that. Zeus is certainly identified with justice. But what's justice? Justice is that you know, Poseidon has the right to punish Odysseus just because he's self, in self-defense. He has, uh, this is justice. I mean, they, you know, justice is simply keeping the order. That's the, I mean, there is justice, but it's not justice that any other system would think of. It's the justice of keeping within this given order. Uh, the Zeus and Apollo are all, and all the gods are seen as the source of many miseries of human existence. At one point in the, in the, uh, in the Odyssey, uh, Homer has, uh, has, uh, Odysseus, uh, has Odysseus say, 
uh, the, the gods give more evil than good. Zeus gives more evil than good. So, you know, th that's the way they saw the world. These are symbols of the cosmos. You know, if you want to take the gods literally, you'll miss the point. <clears throat> the whole, all together, they represent what the world is understood to be like. So the only thing there is for us is our own excellence, our own de decision to get three things in life. A name that's immortal because the, the, the immortality isn't there, but we can only get that name by working in such a way as to give dignity to ourselves and to help humanity. This is the, the tragic message of Sophocles and into modern atheistic existentialism, that that's what life is really all about. Not seeking some kind of reward, but being your own, you know, accountable to yourself, being tough on yourself, doing the, the difficult thing, committing yourself and then taking responsibility for it and not just sort of, you know, wavering about, you know, when, 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 when you come to people like Nietzsche later on, he says, you know, when you make a decision, make it as if it's going to happen forever. You know, don't just say, oh, I have another chance tomorrow. You know, this, this level of, that's all you have in life if you don't have any other hope of some other kind of situation. So, basically, the second main thing, so there's Homer's cosmos, there's the polis, the polis is the city, the city-state, the necessary condition for living a truly human life, as we've seen from, from uh, you'll see in Thucydides as well, it's not just another place to live, it's, uh, you have to live this kind of community life and committed life and concerned life for you to be fully human, so Tiresias is not human. Uh, and Apollo, finally, the two commandments that should lead your life, guide your life, are no Apollo's two commandments. Seek to know yourself as best you know who you, who you can be. This is what Sophocles is doing. Oedipus is seeking to know who he is <laughs> at, this, you know, at a great risk to himself. And, and, and balance is best means do your best always. Balance doesn't mean go for the 70, it means go for the 90. It doesn't mean go for the 70, not the 50 or the 90. Do whatever you're doing. You're as a student now, Oedipus as the ruler of this, king, of this place. Do your very, very best using your mind. Thank you for putting up with me.